time for about the first couple of days I had alien I called it alien arm my hand just kept kind of spinning in the air uh, I actually accidentally punched the ER doctor who was very very kind she was so <laughs> nice she was, you know you're going to recover everything and we're going to go out for steak and as she was talking to me and I was sitting there crying because I couldn't speak to her I accidentally punched her in the face I felt terrible <laughs> I was like oh. um in my head at least I was saying that it didn't come out but I I was trying This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to episode 217 of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your experience with stroke and you've been thinking about reaching out to be a guest on the show, but we're waiting for the right time, this is it. If you go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, you will find a form that you can fill out to apply to be a guest on the show. As soon as I receive it, I will respond with more details on how you can choose a time that works for you for both of us to meet over Zoom. Also, I would love to hear from people that have any stroke-related questions. So if you have had a burning question that you'd like to ask me uh, that's stroke-related, please do feel free to also go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact and select ask a question from the drop-down. Once you've done that, Again, I will receive this notification and I will compile some questions and make some shorter episodes that give you my perspective on your questions. Now, of course, that cannot be medical in nature as I'm not a doctor and I cannot comment on your specific situation with regards to your medical status, but I can give you my thoughts about something that is stroke related. So I would love it if you went ahead and asked me a question and then I'll compile a episode of say four or five questions that I'm answering and making available to everybody. And hopefully there'll be more people just like you who wanted to know the answer to that specific question question. So today's guest is Kristen Brickle, who was 40 when what she thought was another migraine turned out to be a hemorrhagic stroke. Kristen Brickle, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate My it. Pleasure. Thank you for being here. Tell me a little bit about what happened to you. So I have had migraines since I was a kid and thought I was just having a really bad migraine for a few days. Um, it kept escalating and I'm a nurse. And so as nurses, we are terrible patients. Um, and so I ignored the fact that it was getting worse. Um, and on it started on Friday, Saturday, it was worse. Sunday, it was worse. Monday, it was exponentially worse. Um, Monday, I went to my neurologist. I had an infusion because typically when my migraines would get very bad, that would kind of help. And what's an infusion? Uh, I had an infusion of it's prime pro, was primarily magnesium and fluids. So, uh -huh. and that would usually kind of take it back. Um, and it did a little bit, but didn't re resolve the headache. And his nurse and I, ironically enough, that morning were discussing the fact that with complex migraines, we would never know if we were having an event. Talk about ominous and you know, if we were to have an event, we wouldn't even know. So that was Monday around noon. Tuesday morning, I woke up and struggled to get out of bed. And on Wednesday morning, I really struggled to get out of bed. And my two dogs didn't want to leave my side. Um, and nothing was getting better. And is that and unusual for the dogs to not leave your side? Was there something different about that normally? It was different. They always were very kind of, um, they would follow me around. They're, they were big, you know, they're big dogs. Um, they would follow me around, but not this closely. And my boy dog, um, who's the bigger of the two, literally was glued to my side. I mean, he didn't even want to go out to, to go to the bathroom. Wow. He didn't want to go down the stairs. He was right next to me, which he was always close to me, but this was very abnormal. And he kind of, kept leaning against me when I would sit down. It was very, very strange. Um, and I just thought he was being extra clingy that day. You know, didn't really think much of it, kind of dismissed it because I had been working 20 something hour days, you know, 18, 20 hour days because it was the middle of COVID. Mm -hmm. And I was in charge of 12 dialysis clinics and 
operations and making sure that people were here, there and everywhere. So we had a routine and there was a lot going on. And uh, I had my call with my team that morning and we asked the same questions every morning. And I went to go start writing the same notes I wrote every morning. And I kept writing the second letter instead of the first. I was like, why am I doing that? That's really annoying. And I was like irritating myself. Mm. Um, And I kept thinking, well, that's really annoying. Stop it. But I just thought, you know, I have a really bad headache and I haven't slept much. And that must be it. Totally dismissed it. Um, And then after the call, I would always do a summary email. So I started to type and I was mistyping horribly. And when I would go to hit backspace, I kept hitting the equal sign, which is right next to it. And I did it over and over and over and over again to the point where just before everything kind of happened, I looked and I had something like 26 emails open because I couldn't finish an email, which is very odd for me. Mm-hmm. Um. But again, I just figured I'm frustrated, I'm tired, and and I don't feel good, and and I'm pushing. So I got up to um, get something to drink, and I was on the phone with a, a colleague, and I said, you know, we have a call in, in another hour or so. This was around 12.30, 1 o'clock. I'm going to go grab something to drink, use the bathroom, and and get ready for our afternoon calls. And she said, You're, you don't sound right. And I said, well, you know, I don't feel right, but what am I going to do? Well, maybe you should call the doctor. I said, what are they going to do? So I dismissed it again and I hung up with her. And when I went to go get up from my chair in my office, which um, was across the hall from kind of my master bedroom and my bathroom, um, I fell. And that's when I knew that I, that something was happening. Um, And so my first thought as a nurse was stay calm. And I had a full length mirror in the room kind of leaning against the wall. So I kind of scooched my way over to it to check my face because I thought, well, if my face isn't drooping, it's not a stroke. It's still just a migraine that knocked me to the ground Mm -hmm. and made my hand spin uncontrollably and my foot spin uncontrollably. That makes sense. (laughs) So I crawled over. My face looked fine. At least it did to me. Um. And so I thought, well, I'm going to call my mom, who's also a nurse, and have her come and take a look at me. Not 911, but I call my mom. <laughs> so I did, uh, or I tried to, I should say. Um, and I, my phone, I couldn't get my my passcode to unlock my phone. My phone wouldn't unlock. So then I started kind of panic. That's when I started to actually panic. Um, and I have, I had a house phone, couldn't tell you what the phone number was. We just had it because it was kind of a cheaper bundle with the cable <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and it was up on my desk. So I, I managed to get myself up to grab the phone and the phone was the kind of phone where you could dial it and then hit send kind of like a cell phone. And I kept dialing and hitting end kind oh. of like I was writing backwards and typing backwards. Oh. Same thing was happening with the phone. So I freaked out. Um, and put my cell phone on the ground and I ca- I started to cry and I just started kind of shaking my head back and forth. And ironically, little known fact, if you wiggle your nose enough on your phone, you can swipe your phone open to your last calls. And that's how I opened my phone. Say that um, again. Say that again. I was kind of like freaking out and going, no, 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 no. And my, my nose was going like this against my phone. And if you swipe on an iPhone, it will actually swipe over to your last call log. And that's how I was able to call my mom. Okay, that's interesting. I'm going to have to try that and Google it and find out what's going on there. Because that sounds like a bit of a miracle to me. And it may have been because I have (laughs) only been able to duplicate it twice since. And mind you, I had an Apple Watch, which after my stroke, I realized had I just clicked back on my wrist, it would have dialed the Uh emergency number. But at the time, I didn't know that. But after my stroke, I must have, I must do that twice a week where it it starts to try to dial. And I'm like, no, 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 all the time. But at the time, I didn't know. Um, So I finally did get my mom on the phone. 
And I thought I was talking to her in full sentences because she was responding to me like I was. Uh-huh. I nope. wasn't. Not so much. So she came and and was convincing me to to call an ambulance, and it kind of went on from there. So and then I ended up. you went to hospital, and what did they discover? They um, so I I was conscious and cognizant up until the hospital. I knew by the time I got into the ambulance that I wasn't speaking because at that point I I realized that I wasn't communicating with anybody but my mom, um, and the cat scan because i at the time I, I actually had a nerve simulator implanted in the back of my skull so i couldn't go into an mri um and so they had to put me in a cat scan to evaluate anything and it showed that i had a pretty major uh bleed and stroke so i had a, a stroke in my parietal lobe and a bleed um in the back of my skull yeah. so and it was pretty diffuse by then they think it had started over the weekend and just been progressively growing. Um, yeah. What I don't remember, but I was told later, is that my I have very, very low blood pressure normally, mm. and my blood pressure spiked um, while I was in the ER, and they had to give me multiple doses of medication to bring it back down. So I did, I did pass out at some point in the ER. I don't remember that. Yeah, uh, that sounds familiar. Um, so you know with the bleed do they know the underlying cause what caused the rupture they still don't um as, as of right now my neurologist and primary care's theory is that i had covid before covid was kind of known uh -huh. and that there was some trickle down effects and some you know bleeding um and coagulation issues that were resulting from that mm -hmm. Um, but we've never actually identified because I had no risk factors. So I had low blood pressure, low cholesterol. I had no, um, because it was a hemorrhagic, I had no known reason. I had no AVM. There was no known reason for me to have had the stroke. Mm. You just got lucky. Yeah. <laughs> so how long did you spend in hospital? I was there for six days. Uh, probably would have been there longer, but I threatened to leave AMA um, because they weren't helping me. Uh, I wasn't getting PT. I wasn't getting any sleep. Um, it was pretty awful because it was in the middle of COVID. So I, and I was trying to be understanding of that, but there came a point where I just wanted to sleep. Um, and so I said, you know, I can go home and do some of the things that are not happening here. Let me go home. Um, which is what ended up happening after I think I had been transitioned to mostly oral meds because I did start having seizures because of where the the bleed had occurred. Um, and so once that had transitioned from IV to oral medications, I was able to to go home. So I had, I think, six CAT scans while I was in there, mm -hmm. something like that. They said to never have another CAT scan in my life. <laughs> yeah, CAT scans, MRIs, I don't know how many I had. I can't remember. There would have been so, so many, especially MRIs. And oh my gosh. Um, and going into the tube of the MRI machine was always something I had to uh, plan for because I couldn't cope with being enclosed in that space, which is something I didn't realize I couldn't cope with until it started happening. Yeah. Uh, but that's interesting. So what I do is I can relate to your situation. So my first bleed was a small one and then it kept getting bigger and then over seven or eight days and then I ignored it and I was told, you know, you don't look right and I told them I do. Uh, I was yeah. told to go to get it checked out and I said, I'm too busy. I've got work to do. Um, I did everything that I shouldn't have done. I did the exact opposite to what I should have done. And then as it bled, things more and more things went offline so you know first it was my toe and then it was my my foot and then it was my entire my my leg to my knee and then it was my entire leg and then my entire left side and that's when i finally did something about it even though i didn't want to even though i was told to go to the hospital i was still arguing with people then um, but finally got there and then the second bleed 
I was at uh, at work, which I wasn't supposed to be at work. I went to work just for one day, just to hang out with my my team. Uh, and then I was telling them to take me to hospital. We drove past the hospital instead of stopping at the hospital. I told them to keep going. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then I passed out at hospital when I finally got there th- at that time, the second time. And I did something similar to you. Like I just blacked out and I didn't know what was happening. And now other people have filled in the gaps kind of as to what has happened after I passed, I passed out. One of the things that happened is I didn't recognize my wife. Now, when you woke up from uh, that situation, what were you left with? What were the things that you had to overcome and recover from? And how long did it take? Because for me, it took about 18 months for things to sort of start leveling off and get better before they got worse again. What what was it like for you? So I, it was interesting because I, when I went into the hospital, I had to go alone because with COVID, they wouldn't let me, yeah. wouldn't let anybody go with me. Um, and so I went not being able to speak um, and really not being able to communicate because it was my right side that was affected and I'm right do- right side dominant. So I couldn't write, I couldn't type, I couldn't speak. Um, I, re- I did recover my speech within about six hours but I frequently was um, aphasic in that I wasn't saying the right words or I couldn't come up with the word I meant. Um, I would hear what somebody would say, but it would take me a very long time. And it still happens now when I'm tired, trying to process what somebody's saying to me. Um, So when I, and I couldn't stand or uh, control my arms. So like, the initial period of time for about the first couple of days, I had alien, I called it alien arm. My hand just kept kind of spinning in the air. Uh, I actually accidentally punched the ER doctor who was very, very kind. She was so <laughs> nice. She was, you know, you're going to recover everything and we're going to go out for steak. And as she was talking to me and I was sitting there crying because I couldn't speak to her, I accidentally punched her in the face. I felt terrible. <laughs> I was like, oh. Um, in my head, at least I was saying that it didn't come out, but I, I was trying, um, and I couldn't stop my foot from spinning. So, um, I, the next day they did try to get me up to walk like with a gate belt and a couple of people on either side of me to see if, if even though my foot was still kind of doing its own thing, if I could, if I could emulate and thankfully and it's ironic. I had been, <laughs> I had bought a Peloton um, in the December prior to all of this, so about six stationary, months prior. Stationary bike kind of exercise thing, right? Yeah, and then we were pretty much in lockdown. So, other than when I was working, I made sure if I wasn't commuting in and out of New York to to have to be physically in the built in the um, clinics, I was making sure that I rode pretty much every day. And so I had strengthened my legs and my arms pretty well. So I was in pretty good shape um, despite it all. And they said that actually helped me quite a bit because my blood flow was good and it helped from a strength perspective. So even though my foot was sort of doing its own thing, the rest of the muscles were stabilizing. Mm -hmm. So I could kind of ambulate a little bit with, with two people on either side of me and walker. Um, So they did try to move me around. Uh, and eventually by the time I went home, I could, I could walk, um, as long as it was fairly flat and, you know, I didn't have to go up or downstairs and that sort of thing. Um, up and downstairs was a little dicey. Um, certainly didn't do that alone and I couldn't be alone for six weeks yeah. so, because I kept having mild seizures. Even once I, ha- I actually had a major seizure, um, three days after the stroke itself, where I thought I was having a secondary stroke because it was actually more severe than the first. Mm. Um, The symptoms lasted longer. The, the, um, the speech did not come back for almost, I think 10 or 12 hours that time. And so I thought I was never going to speak again. But family life like at home, do you live on your own or do you have people around you? At the time I lived with my boyfriend. Uh, We, we were together for eight years at that point. 
um, and our two dogs. And uh, he was going out of his mind because he couldn't come to the hospital. Um, and my mom was about 20 minutes away. So when I came home, I was like, I used to joke that I went to daycare every day. Um, either he would drop me off at my parents um, before he went to work or my mom would come down and work at our house uh, when she could so that somebody was with me all the time. Um, but it was tough. And and actually, think, thankfully, my uncle had done home care physical therapy his whole career. And so he's the one who tried to help me rehab a lot of things. Um, if not for him, I would not have probably thought to do some of the exercises that I did mm. Um, because I didn't really get any, like the person who came to evaluate me for OT was like, well, you're already too advanced. I was like, I can't do anything. What do you mean I'm too advanced? I can't move my hand with any purpose. I can't feed myself. I can't write. I can't brush my hair. I, like, I can't do anything. He's like, but but you can stack coins. Oh, well, that's helpful. That's <laughs> totally useful in my day to day. Because that's what I have to do every day is stack coins. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know that it's very interesting. You know, just before we started, I was talking about how we're not supposed to have anything in common, you and I. We're from completely different parts of the world. You know, we have, we don't know each other. Not, we have nothing in common except this stroke thing. And yet we all struggle with the same struggles. The, the ability for me to get physical therapy after the first and second bleed was zero. And I couldn't type an email. I didn't remember who came to visit me. I couldn't work. I couldn't drive. Uh, I couldn't go to the toilet because I was too exhausted by the time I got back. Mm -hmm. There were so many issues, and nobody thought that I needed to have uh, physical therapy or uh, cognitive therapy or an evaluation or anything. And I went months and months without anybody uh, – saying anything except for my my counselor my psychologist who said to me you know have you ever heard of a neuropsych uh, i said no what's that she said, well go and see a neuropsychologist because they're going to help you work out your cognitive deficits and they'll give you some skills to help you uh, improve them or overcome them or get better and i was like well oh, okay i'll do that and we have a public system here which you can access, but you have to wait for services if there's a, a long queue or a lot of people waiting to get through. And again, it didn't occur to me to just go private and, and pay whatever it costs. I think it was going to be four or $500 for the evaluation. So I waited nine months to get access to a neuropsychologist through this pub public system. And in the nine months, things started to improve by themselves. And as the clot that had developed in my head started to get absorbed or dealt with by the head and it started to decrease in size more and more of my brain came back online um so by the time i went to this evaluation they were convinced that there was nothing wrong with me and that i didn't need anything anyway and it's like damn it now now you guys think that i'm that there was nothing wrong with me like i'm pulling the wool over your eyes which is not true so that was interesting. Uh, accessing any type of service that was going to – and even information, you know, being told that do this or look at that or contact these people or have a look at this organization. There was nothing of that as well. And I had to discover it all on my own. My wife had to ha help me discover it. It's just like – You've you're got, you got people with the worst kind of condition, like a neurological condition where their brain is not working at the same time and you're just sending them out there and you're expecting them to pick up the pieces on their own. It's so weird. And When then, you're totally exhausted. Yeah. But what's <laughs> yeah. even more weird is that I expected that that was unique in Australia, not the entire world. No, and I've, I've actually had so many people reach out to me um, that are within the same age range or that have family members in the same age range that either have TBIs or strokes that had similar experiences because we look fine. And yeah. so if you look fine, the assumption is you are fine. Yeah. And because I recovered my speech in the hospital, 
the literally they would come in like I remember saying to my mom at one point I haven't eaten in days because they keep bringing in food and putting it on a tray across the room that I can't get to if you've had a stroke and you're in recovery you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be you're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind like how long will it take to recover will I actually recover what things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. And then even when they bring it in front of me, I can't get it into my mouth because I can't feed myself because my hand isn't working and my left hand, I was never great with. So, you know, I'm trying here, but most of it's on my hospital gown or in my lap. So we're not doing so great here. Yeah. Like I'm hungry <laughs> and I'm cranky and I have a headache and there's a lady down the hall screaming. Okay. It's not going well. Um, and then you know, just trying to get help even in the hospital setting. So like you figure in acute setting, you get assistance. Yeah, I wasn't. Um, so when I went home, forget about it. It was really, um, I, in fact, I remember they, they ordered my neurologist is fantastic. And I have to say he's, if not for him and my primary care doctor, I'm not sure I could have progressed the way I did because they're both very, they're pragmatic, but they're also, you know, they they stay on top of kind of current everything. I don't know when they sleep because they read <laughs> constantly. Um, but they are very, very holistic in that they're they stay at the top of their field, but they also look at the whole person. You know, you're not just a 15 minute appointment. And so they were very cognizant of making sure that I wasn't getting too depressed, you know, that I was kind of taking care of myself and how was I doing? And they knew they've known me for years. And so they knew me as a person before and they could see the difference in me after. And so they knew where my deficits were inherently from that, thankfully, um, to, to say, you know, I know you can't get assistance with this, but I recommend you work on, you know, your dexterity or work on your fine motor, work on speech, you know, what, what is working, what isn't working, that sort of thing. Um, but if they didn't know me so well, I'm not sure I would have done that. Or if I wasn't a nurse and hadn't helped other people I'd seen go through it, I'm not sure I would have known what to do. Yeah. And I was so tired that the thought of, of even looking for information, I mean, just getting through the day was exhausting. Never mind researching. Yeah, absolutely. So are you, do you link? your migraines do you personally link your migraines to this underlying condition that you didn't know about maybe and has are the migraines different have they changed changed now yes um i actually i just was reading uh something a couple of weeks ago ironically about somebody that they believe was having what was the article i was reading that had been having like mini bleeds, they actually thought that for years their migraines were were not actually migraines. They were actually almost like small TIAs mm. over time. Um, and my neurologist has said that that's really my only risk factor was the migraines. And so because I started with them so young, I don't I don't know. Um, and I had a pretty major head injury in 2006 because I had a pretty bad head on collision. Um, and so I don't know if that was a factor as well, um, because I certainly, you know, I went up and over an airbag with a seatbelt on. So that certainly didn't help my brain um, <laughs> or or my, you know, my my skull. 
but that's really the only other impetus that could have potentially led to this, um, at least that I can backtrack to. Mm -hmm. And I, and the migraines have changed such that I had, I had a headache for probably the first three and a half, four months without relief. Now I get them more frequently than I did. I had gone almost 10 years where once I had the, this, the nerve stimulator implanted and I had retrained the, the nerves, I really very rarely got migraines anymore. Um, I had just started getting them again in February of that year of 2020. So I do think there was some correlation there. And again, I, they think I probably had COVID in like December, January. And so that may have led to all of it, but they've substantially changed and that I get them much more frequently now. I'm back to pretty much every couple of days. I have some version of a headache, yeah. whether it's knocking me out or it's just I deal with it. It's there. Yeah. Interesting. Are you kind of thinking about any future incident? Do you have those concerns about is it going to happen again or anything like that? What What about that? Yeah. Um, if, I, I will say it took me, um, it was probably four or five months before I real before I made the connection that every Monday and Tuesday, because it happened on a Wednesday, every Monday and Tuesday, I would frenetically try to get things done. And it didn't matter if it was cleaning or when I went back to work, if it was getting work done, but I would have this insane anxiety about getting things done on Monday and Tuesday. And it took me almost like five months to connect that I was doing it because I was afraid of having another one on a Wednesday. Like Wednesdays started to scare me. And to this day, like I still don't always know when it's Wednesday. It's like my brain doesn't want to know that Wednesdays exist anymore. Um, and it's been two years, so it's it's sort of funny. But I also, I had COVID after two years, I officially was diagnosed with COVID. And I've had something like 35 COVID tests that were all negative in the span of the two years. I actually got COVID at the end of May and then, and I was okay, it was kind of mild, like cold symptoms. Actually, I thought I just had allergies and felt better. And then a couple of weeks later felt really horrible. And I felt exactly like I did just prior to the stroke. And I started having the same exact pattern of symptoms, the dizziness, the kind of fatigue, the off balance stuff, the mistyping. And I was like, oh no, uh-uh, nope. And I immediately asked for an MRI. And I said, I know I'm being overly ridiculous, but I didn't do it last time. And so I don't want to just dismiss it. And my, my primary care doctor said, listen, I can tell you I've looked at your scans over and over again. Um, it wouldn't have mattered if you went to the if you if you went to the hospital sooner because I would have told you if you asked me not to get TPA, it wouldn't have changed the outcome. It actually would have potentially killed you because of the way the bleed happened. So he said, I, I actually think to some extent that was like a protection for you. But he said, uh, I will I will order the MRI because I know that you're scared. And when I had the MRI, it actually induced a seizure. Uh -huh. It's the weirdest thing. Um, but it did show that everything is kind of status quo. It but I worry. Amnesia. Is it psychosomatic? Did you have a part to play in that? or uh No. So apparently, oddly enough, and I, and I was like, did someone maybe think that might have been important to tell me two years ago? Apparently, um, because of the area where... It, the reason that I have the seizures is because of the area that was impacted. And because I wasn't uh, epileptic prior, um, even though I guess there's some, there's some folks that believe that migraines are a form of seizure, but never officially. Because um, <laughs> uh, I had said to him, it was the strange thing in, in the MRI, you know, when they, the signal sounds change as it kind of moves around. The when it got to the changes yeah like the else. sounds change and it kind of like changes signal sound so when it got to the third sound i was like i've never heard that sound before and i mean i've had so many mris 
was like, wait, I've never heard that sound before. And as soon as that sound changed and I didn't recognize it, that's when the seizure started. And I was like, oh, come on. And then when the next signal sound came on, I recognized it, the seizure stopped. And the next signal sound, because it's like five or six signals, the next one came on, I didn't recognize it again, it started again. And then the next one I recognized it stopped. It was the like the creepiest experience. I was like, does no one see that this is happening? Is the person watching that screen not seeing what is going on? Meanwhile, I'm trying not to have a massive panic attack in this tube. Um, but no one's monitoring my blood pressure or my pulse. So they didn't know that I was having a panic attack in there. Um, but I always worry, what if it were to happen again? Because now I do live alone. So, and I mean, I was, I was alone that day other than the dogs, but because my, my ex was at, at work, but he would have come home eventually. Um, so I do, I do get a little bit overly cautious. Yeah. Um, Fair enough. Uh, okay. Better to be overly cautious than not at all, which we've been, and that doesn't end well. But you don't know what you don't know, so you behave appropriately, uh, and then you learn. Hopefully, you learn from that, and then you become more uh, aware of yourself and your body, and you take action quicker, hopefully. And I won't live in fear. Let me be clear. Like I, yeah. I am afraid, but I also am mindful that I won't live my life in fear because one of the things it taught me, and this is, and I say this to people and they think I'm crazy when I say it, but I actually feel like the stroke gave me back my life. As strange as that sounds. So tell me about this. You feel like the stroke gave you back your life situation. This is interesting. Yeah. So it, I, don't get me wrong. It's it's completely changed my life in that, like my relationship ended. My I, I left my job that was my career for twenty plus years. Um, it's changed a lot. I I can't really be a full time nurse anymore because my the fatigue level that I have is just not sustainable for a typical you know twelve hour shift. I can do short shifts, but that's difficult. I was an administrator, so I was doing really high level function. And I could do it, but it was so taxing that I couldn't do anything else. Um, but when I say that, I say I say it because it gave me a different perspective. And it took me a year for it to give me a different perspective. Because for that first year, I dug into, it's taken everything. I won't let it take anything else. Um, and so I, I like bulled through, like, bullied my way through that first year unsuccessfully, like miserably unsuccessfully, um, just trying to like return to normal. And that wasn't really normal. I wasn't, or I wasn't me. I wasn't my old self, mm. but I was trying to be, and everybody expected me to be because I looked like me mm. and I talked like me. And if they caught me at the right time, I could think quickly. And like <laughs> one of the, uh, one of my colleagues said to me one day, you're still quicker than most people. And I said, well, I think I should say thank you, but I'm not really sure <laughs> because you're catching me around 930 in the morning. So I'm still pretty good. Ask me that again at one. Probably won't say that. Uh, but it was because I knew that that was kind of my rote world like i knew that environment so well that i could do a lot of responses almost automatically because it had just been my universe for so long um and a, a year went by almost a well actually a full year went by and i started to realize that i just could not do what i was doing i was i was just repeating the same pattern that had led to the stroke um of this high stress and no downtime and not taking care of myself. And so I started to to really back off and try to take care of myself, which ultimately led to my leaving the job. Um, and when I did that, I took some time to really evaluate the prior year and like look at it and thought, wow, what was I thinking? <laughs> um, and so it 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 led me to a path that I'm really grateful for where I was able to really kind of find myself again 
that I'd gotten lost along the way and that I never want to go back to that lost person again. And I don't believe if that's, if the stroke had happened, if if the stroke hadn't happened, I don't believe I would have gotten there because I had just gotten into this like hamster wheel pattern. Again, that's so powerful. This is exactly my experience. It's so weird. You know, it took me maybe three or four years to get to that point, but something significant happened in the first 12 months, which was that I went and discovered, uh, I did this course, you know, first time, you know, that I'd ever done a course that was about um, kind of self-help type of course, but it was about connecting with your heart and discovering how your head operates and then your gut and all that type of stuff. It was called M-braining, multiple brain integration techniques. And mm. what, what it helped me do was discover that I was on a path previously that was not sustainable and it wasn't what led to the bleed in my head the bleed in my head was as a result of an avm but it i had done a lot of things to support the avm to not be healthy and to pop and all that type of thing and i was like okay i get it so so it's there's an avm there but i'm creating the perfect storm around it for it to do its thing and I need to stop doing that stuff. And I don't think I ever would have stopped being the guy that I was before stroke if I hadn't uh, been through that experience. So I really relate to what you're saying. So a lot of things changed for you after stroke. Your job changed. Your relationship status changed. Um, what other things changed? And were some of those, were all of those of your choosing or did some of those come about the, and and therefore you weren't kind of preferring most, yeah most were not of my choosing uh the i was terrified to go back to work and at the same time i felt like it was the only thing that i still knew because ironically i still couldn't write or type a week before i went i was due to go back like when my leave was going to run out and because of the position that I had, I had full pay for the the period of time that I was out. And then once that date hit, it was going to drop, like my pay was going to drop, my benefits were going to go to to um, full cost, et cetera. And um, I was terrified because I, I thought, I can't afford that. We can't afford that in the house. I was covering my boyfriend as a domestic partner. And so we can't afford this. So I thought, okay, I got to go back to work. And a week prior, I still couldn't write or type. And I was like, how am I going to do this? How, like, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to record every meeting and then take the time to do what with it? Because I still couldn't couldn't do anything with those recordings. And and I thought, I, I'm not going to be able to process it. Um, and so I got on the phone with my boss to make a plan to kind of step back into my job slowly. And when I got on the phone with her, I sat down like I always did with a notebook and a pen because I'm a compulsive note taker and I could write perfectly. And I mean, perfect penmanship. And if I showed you like the page before and the page of notes I wrote with her, I got off the phone and burst into tears because it was like, what just happened? I felt like I was having an out of body experience. It was the most bizarre thing And the next day, I got a phone call about a doctor's appointment, and I couldn't write the date and the time that they called to tell me. So it was like I could only write notes if they were related to work. It's really weird. It would have been my first clue uh, (laughs) that it was not healthy (laughs) because that was all my brain could could operate on uh, because that's all it had been doing. Um, And so my, my boyfriend at the time hated my job, thought that it was taking up too much time, which it was. Um, And I was commuting, so I was traveling a lot. And then he really didn't want me to go back to work, but he was also concerned about the the financial piece as well, because, you know, just the reality of that. So he was sort of semi-supportive, but concerned and trying to convince me to to do something different. And I was just bullheaded about it because I thought, well, I just wrote a page of notes. So what what's the problem here? Like, this is obviously going to be good for me. <laughs> totally irrational. Uh, Or at least I'd convinced myself it was rational at the time. Mm. Um, And so when I went back to work, the fatigue and the absolute, I mean, the second day that I was back, 
I literally got to about one o'clock and my, my whole body just shut down. I couldn't even function. And I didn't start till nine that day, which is, was late for me. And by one o'clock, I was so exhausted that I couldn't even formulate a sentence. I had to force myself to go and lay down and I slept for four and a half hours because I was just so tired. So fast forward a couple months to this argument that we had and he said, I'm, I'm done. I can't, I can't do this. I can't, I can't watch you kill yourself. You know, like I, I can't do it. And we subsequently made peace with the fact that it, we needed some time and space because he wasn't dealing with it either. Mm. So there was a lot, you know, there was lots of other factors there, but um, he had asked me to move out. So I did. And that was devastating. And so then I threw myself further into work. Um, not great. Mm. And then work started falling apart because I really couldn't do it. Mm. I really physically couldn't maintain the level that I needed to, to do what I, what I was doing. Um, and so over the course of time, I took a couple of weeks off inter interspersed to kind of try to decompress. And, you know, we went straight from heavy COVID to COVID vaccinations to this, to, and it was always something, there was always something coming up. And somehow I, I always ended up, I'm very organized and meticulous. And so I would always end up being the point person because I didn't ever say no. Mm -hmm. And I'm very type A. And so mm -hmm. people de depended on that. And I just, I couldn't maintain it. And so at the end of it, the it was a mutual decision to just say, this is not, not going to work. And yeah. so. Well, it sounds familiar. Uh, a lot of people would relate to that. Trying to get back to your old life or your previous life or the same stage you were at, or I'm not sure what the word is, but and then having a realization that you can't. And then the great part is a lot of people have a realization that they shouldn't because it wasn't healthy and because it was leading to um, serious ill health. And I think the blessing is, is that you got away with it to an extent, as in, you know, you're still above ground and I'm the same and the people who have been on this podcast are the same. So we've had that second chance. We've had the opportunity to reevaluate and people who are early on in their uh, journey, hopefully are listening to this and they're going, oh, okay, here's maybe another sign that I should pay attention to the changes that I need to make in my life. And it is possible to live life similar but in a different way in a more mm -hmm. supportive or more gentle way and i'm proof of that you're proof of that i have every friday off from my job from work to be here to make sure that i can interview people on my podcast and do all the admin side that's necessary that would never have been possible before uh the rest of my before you know my old life it wouldn't have been possible for me to do that uh i as a result might work an hour or two extra monday to thursday just to fit in all the things that need to be done but that gives me this amazing opportunity to be here on a friday your thursday and do these interviews and then also sometimes they lead into saturday and saturday might be a half day or a full day but that allows me to live my passion to express myself to see to meet people that are similar to me from around the world to have amazing conversations and i didn't realize how much i needed that in my life and i don't know that i ever would have found that i ever only would have ever been hanging out with work people talking work stuff um speaking with clients um, spending saturdays running around for them and all that type of thing and i never would have got to experience this side of it so and and you know what's great is it didn't come to me consciously or it wasn't it wasn't something that i planned out it just i fell into a podcast don't ask me how you fall into a podcast whole thing right but you do it it kind of was an idea i tried it. <coughs> i tried it out and it happened and then i kept doing it and then what i kept doing 
was looking for ways to solve problems that were related to the podcast, little problems like what microphone should I use? Okay, I just solved that problem for the next month or two. I didn't try and solve another one. Then editing was an issue and then uploading was an issue and all these things. And I kind of just kept rolling with it and found that I had this other skill, I suppose. And I love it. And that's as a result of the stroke. So I know where you're coming from. I totally get it. Um, what is your work life like now? How much of it do you do? So I actually am right now I'm just doing, and I don't say just cause it's, it's still a lot of work, but I'm doing network marketing for now. Um, because it allows me to kind of flex my time and, and do a lot. And what I didn't realize, similar to what you were just talking about, I didn't realize that I had a bunch of sort of random skill sets that I'd picked up over the years because of some of the different jobs and because I'd always been that go-to person that I've always wanted to get things done. So if somebody else couldn't do it, I'd try to figure it out. I'd Google it, I'd YouTube it, whatever, I'd figure it out. Um, and I had a lot of random skill sets that I have started to refine and build and actually kind of good at some of them and I enjoy them. So it's been fun to kind of take a lot of the the pieces of my job that I used to enjoy and still do them um, and take, like, I love taking care of people. I love it. Um, and so I can still do that in a different way. So I'm still doing health and wellness. I'm still helping people, but it's just in a different way. And that's okay. Mm. Um, and I've helped a lot of people along the way just in sharing my story um, to understand that you can be okay. You know, I've had people that I work with reach out to me and say, I can't believe you had a stroke. Like, I didn't know. I'm like, yeah, happened. True story. Um yeah. surprise you know, it's yeah. like um or or people that you know i went to school with years ago and yeah. um a lot of folks have said you know I'm, I'm grateful that i've heard your story because at least i know there is a light at the end of the tunnel it's not you know there isn't because i think some people assume and like i did a lot with um i i try to do a fair amount with stroke awareness anyway but during may which is national stroke awareness month in, in the u.s i did a fair amount of um videos where i said you know when you think of stroke what do you think of i want you to think of me because people don't think of of younger people having strokes and it and we actually are a pretty big group um and it's it's like people always assume it's an older sicker person and it's not yeah so it's huge it's huge i mean you're you're 40 and I was 37, and I've interviewed so many people between the ages who had their stroke between the ages of, say, 30 and 50. It's yeah. just intense. Uh, most of the people on my podcast, more than 220 people or something, uh, were were between that age group. I imagine there's a few of the only a few of them that weren't. Um, and that might just be a, a sign of the fact that it's Instagram or people older aren't on there. I don't know, but very very young thing not many of us have got a lot of wrinkles on our faces yet um so emotionally you're well cognitively and you know mentally it sounds like you're pretty able to convince yourself of everything and um you know use your brain to get out of a lot of challenges or problems or things that are going wrong emotionally <laughs> What do, you, what do you like emotionally? Because you went through not only the emotional roller coaster of stroke, but also then the emotional roller coaster of, you know, breaking up a, uh, being in a breakup that ended an eight year relationship. So have you become aware that you need to do some work in that space? Yeah. So it, it's ironic because at the time, I, I just dove further into work which was the initial, which, which was the whole basis of the problem. And then when work was taken away too, I really had to like, look at myself and which is why I say now I can look at it. Now I can be cognizant and more aware of myself um, emotionally and, and mentally, because very early on, I was just angry and frustrated all the time. And 
angry because nobody was understanding that I was just exhausted and that getting through my day was like earth shatteringly exhausting. Um, angry because nobody could understand that just because I was awake didn't mean I was able to have a full on conversation um, or that at, you know, at six o'clock at night, trying to converse with me was probably not going to end well. Um, And so it took actually having everything removed to dig into all of that. And once I started to, I really started to look at why did I let work kind of consume me? What was I sort of running away from? What was kind of the root of that? And a lot of it was just, you know, we had like my ex and I had stopped communicating. And instead of dealing with that, we just both kind of dove into work independently. Um, And so it, once I had to start looking at that, I was like, okay, what was my part in that? You know, I can't speak for him, but, you know, I can identify what pieces I think were his part in it too. And and so, we, and we've spoken since about those things and identified kind of where we both went wrong, but it was, it, t- it took that full year to really be able to do that. And, and even now there are times I think to myself, Lord, why, you know, I say to people all the time, if it won't matter in five minutes, five, five weeks, five days, you know, that whole thing, don't let it bother you. But if you said that to me two years ago, I would have been like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. But I'm pissed off right now. Mm. But now I'm, I really try not to let it bother me or I will say it out loud. And I'm like, okay, I'm moving on because it's not worth my energy. I don't have enough energy to waste on it. Um, and yeah. maybe that's the crux of it is I don't have the energy to, to, to spend on it anymore. Yeah. I, 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 I noticed how much more emotional dramas drain me so if mm-hmm. i have a fallout with my wife or if i do the wrong thing like i do from time to time uh and then it blows up because i think i'm not wrong or i think i'm right and i'm trying to convince her and i'm trying to make her wrong or whatever i'm doing i find that i used to have stamina you know in the old days when i was younger i could go for two weeks sticking to my guns and being arrogant and being obnoxious and being all those things and then giving her a hard time for two weeks by the time i got to the end of those two weeks i actually didn't know what the hell i was upset about or angry about it had been such a long time i'd forgotten what the cause of the (laughs) of the (laughs) argument was (laughs) right and it was just my 20 year old self trying to navigate a way through not knowing anything about, you know, being dumb, pretty much being a 20 year old who's doesn't know anything about anything. And then recently after all the stroke stuff, it's like, man, I want to resolve it within minutes if I can, because if I resolve it in minutes, then I don't have to have the low energy that it takes to get through mm-hmm. for a week or two. Hey, it's not good for my wife or me. It's not healthy. There's nothing good about it. Um, It's usually always trivial. Mm -hmm. And I try to just resolve it as quickly as possible. So the other day, I said something stupid that wasn't, um, wasn't derogatory or that kind of rude. It was just something dumb. And, of course, she lost it at me. And then I was shocked. Why did she lose it at me? And then it was like, oh, hang on a sec. Was it, did I say something wrong? Did I stuff up? I did. Now, I tried to apologize, but she she had an appointment to go to. She jumped in the car and stormed off. And then I rang her, and then she didn't answer. <laughs> and then I, I let it sit for about 10 minutes or 15. And then I rang her back and said, let me apologize. Just let me apologize. And I said, and she said, what are you going to apologize for? And then I told her all the things I was going to apologize for. And then she accepted it because it was legitimate. My apology was legitimate. I was an idiot. I said the wrong thing. I overreacted. I, I, you know, I gave her the whole spiel of what I did wrong. And then when she came back, she was still a little bit, you know, sniggly. You know, she was kind of not wrapped with me. She wasn't going to just let me get away with it. And the next day it was completely gone. Uh, but yeah, that, That's a skill that I wish I had a long time ago. I would have wasted way less time on idiotic things. 
and now I just try and get it out of the way, like within minutes. If I, oh my god, I've done the wrong thing again. Okay, full on into apology mode, and I'm trying to learn not to do it again. I'm not so good at learning not to be an idiot. That just happens, <laughs> but I am really good at apologizing for my behavior and stopping the drama from spreading to the next day and the day after that. And if we've got a lovely event coming up into the lovely event, you know, that's three or four days down the road. It just has to be that way because energy is so precious. And emotionally, I get so, if I'm, if I have an argument with somebody like that, I can't get anything else done. I can't be productive anywhere else. Really takes away my ability to be productive. I used to be able to multitask the anger and something mm -hmm. after the stroke. It was like the anger overtook everything. Mm -hmm. The frustration overtook everything. So it was, and I still don't multitask well anymore. Mm -hmm. Not that anyone truly multitasks. I mean, they've proven that over and over. Nobody mm -hmm. actually multitasks, but we believe we do. Mm -hmm. um, but what I used to be able to do simultaneously, even putting like a TV on at the same time I'm doing something, I can't do that anymore. I, I squirrel, I, you know, I, I am easily distracted and I never was, I could, I could really focus. And that is, I can, but it, I can be easily distracted. So I have to be cognizant of that and I just don't have the energy to spare. So yeah. It's mindful is a word that's overused and comes up for me when you're saying that. It sounds like you have to be mindful on the task. You have to pay attention to the task that you're doing and do that well mm -hmm. not think about everything else that you're thinking about plus trying to do that task because then that task doesn't get done well. Or it takes me four times as long. Uh, yeah. yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people will relate to this stuff because it's a very similar conversation that I've had with a lot of other people I've interviewed about and stroke. It's how, you know, things become, I'm, I'm not sure, there's kind of a level of complexity that stroke creates, but then it teaches you a, a level of making things not complex, like trying to break them down to basic tasks and, and not overdoing it. Mm -hmm. Keeping it simple. I where I used to be very, um, I'm still a complex thinker, but I, I used to, I think, make things harder than they had to be. Sometimes just to, to layer it and other times probably just unnecessarily. And now I'm, I try to keep things as simple as possible because again, it's from an energy conservation perspective. Like I think of that, that analogy with the, the, um, battery, you know, that, as a stroke survivor, like you just, your battery doesn't recharge as well. It doesn't stay charged as long and it takes longer to recharge. And mm -hmm. that's truly the best example mm -hmm. um, because you, it is so difficult to recharge. Like I had an event this weekend and I was going, going, going. And so I'm still kind of, it's Thursday and I'm still trying to recover from three days ago. Yes. Uh, yes. The whole planning the next two or three days of recovery when you know you want to go somewhere and do something that you must go and do because you love it or it's going to be fun or whatever and then knowing that i've got to do nothing for the next two or three days to get able to have I'm that space and time experience yeah that's so weird i remember that whole situation you know uh learning about that at the beginning which was Oh man, that was such a fun time. Why am I so wiped out for three days? And then it's like, okay, it happened again and it happened again. And now it's, we're going to have a fun time. And then we've got nothing planned for the following day at all. Yeah. And I hope my fun days are like Fridays or Saturdays so that I've got a day ahead of me where I can rest and recover. Uh, mm -hmm. And that amount of days has decreased over time, by the way. So, you know, it used to be a whole bunch of days. Now it's a day or half a day where, where I have to have nothing to do so that I can kind of, you know, recharge the battery. Yeah, it's exactly it. Yep. 
yeah. give it more time to recharge. That's a, I and and I have seen it shorten. Um, even in a couple of years, it shortened a little bit, mm. not quite as much as I'd like it to. Uh, mm. But I also really pushed the envelope this past weekend, probably farther than I have in a very long time, and mm. I. I didn't feel good to begin with. So not feeling great and then pushing. It was like, I can do this. I can do this. And by Sunday night, I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. I looked at my uh, friend of mine that I was uh, rooming with in the hotel and I said, I can't, I can't, I can't keep going. My brain is totally against the wall and sliding down it. And and we're gonna we're gonna fall flat on our face. And now 10 minutes after I said that, I like tripped going up the stairs and I was like, see. See, this is what starts to happen. Mm. It's not good. So. Yeah. Yeah. So now looking forward into the future, what do you hope you're going to achieve yeah. and overcome? What's the next phase? Do you have you planned it? Are you planning or are you just taking it month by month? I'm taking it month by month. I mean, I have I have goals. But I think where I used to have, you know, kind of a three-year and a five-year plan and all of this stuff, since everything happened, I realized that I may not have three months. And and not to be morbid, I don't mean that I'm going to die in three months, but I, I kind of try to chunk things up into quarters to a degree, you know, kind of what am I doing for the next quarter? Um, what am I doing for the next, you know, six months. And that's probably about as far out as I think right now, uh, unless it's something that has to be planned further out. Not that I don't have bigger goals, but I sort of keep them very much on the sideline and adapt and adjust as I need to. I'm much more adaptable than I used to be. I was never a very good uh, go with the flow kind of person. And and I'm still, I still like to plan, still a planner, but I'm much more adaptable than I used to be out of necessity. Um, and so my biggest level of planning is is kind of what we were just talking about. Like, okay, I know that this is coming up. I need to make sure that I block time before and after so that I can enjoy it. Um, you know, there's a wedding here. I need to make sure that I have, you know, a day before and a day after so that I can really be present. But I try to make sure I'm really present for things. Um and encourage other people to do the same. So my biggest goal in life outside of, you know, kind of overarching things is just to make sure that I can have a positive impact on the world. <laughs> and that sounds very lofty, but that's really, that's really it. Yeah. Um, it sounds like also you've removed deadlines and therefore you've given yourself more space to get to somewhere. And that's really helpful because therefore there's less disappointment and less opportunity to give yourself a hard time I, oh my gosh i haven't reached my deadline and mm -hmm. i'm never going to do this and going through all that stuff is that yeah i mean i i still set like objectives you know like i want to do this by here but i don't um where i used to beat myself up if i didn't i don't anymore because mm -hmm. i really evaluate did i not get there because I didn't try hard enough or I didn't do the work or did I not get there because something else happened or got in the way, life got in the way, whatever. Um, I, I, I'm much more realistic and, and kind to myself. I was always kind to other people about stuff like that. I could, I could give my teams leeway about why they couldn't, Oh, well, your, your child was sick or your mom was sick. I could do all of that for them. But when it came to me, there was no excuse. There was no leeway. And I was not kind to myself. I had no compassion for myself. Mm -hmm. And I've learned to give myself some grace. Um, so self-compassion, that is an awesome thing for people to remember. Um, and isn't it interesting? You know, I often help people and support people, coach people as well through this. And I say to them, if you were the person coaching and supporting somebody and you're giving advice to that person about something, you know, what would you say to them? And then they would come up with all these amazing things to say to them and all that type of thing. Like, Great. That's the right thing to do. Now, take some of your own advice. 
because you're the same person. You're just as important. You need the same level of understanding and support and um, you need to give yourself a break. Uh, we're, we are our own worst critics and we can be our own worst enemies. But many people wouldn't speak to their friends the way they speak to themselves. Yeah. And I say that to people all the time. And that's become kind of my mantra to people is if you are saying something to yourself and you're, even if it's in your own head and even not out loud, it's the same. That you wouldn't say to your mother, your father, your best friend, mm. then stop saying it to yourself mm. is what you think is exactly how you're going to feel. And that's how you're like, it's just, it eats you from the inside out. So mm. don't do it. Um, yeah. And on yeah. that great piece of advice, thank you so much for reaching out and being on the podcast. Thank you. This was a pleasure. Thanks for joining us on today's episode to learn more about my guests, including to get their links to their social media and other pages. And to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. If you'd like to support this podcast, the best way to do it is to leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and on Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, comment below the video, like the episode, and to get notifications of future episodes, subscribe to the show and hit the notification bell. Sharing the show with family and friends on social media will make it possible for people who may need this type of content to find it easier, and that may make a massive difference to someone that is on the road to recovery after their own experience with stroke. Thanks again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you and see you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog podcast or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure or prevent prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, currency, or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk, and we are not responsible for any information you find there.